Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of this Revolution Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Miles. I'm going to get right into it. Let me bring in my co-host, my homie, my dog, Mr. Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. And since it says we have a guest, I don't really feel that we have a guest, so to speak. This is kind of a, a neighborly conversation we're going to have today. So I'm going to bring everybody in before we play the video. Um, so coming all the way live from a secret bunker somewhere in the great northwest he is the deep state kuba hello everyone uh jason's right i'm less of a guest and more of a kato kalen type <laughs> like uh, <laughs> i'll eat i'll eat your cereal <laughs> i'll even finish the milk and i'll just put it back an empty bottle, an empty carton. That's the official dick move of all dick moves, by the way. And you know, I'm, I'm gonna bring this. I'm gonna bring this next gentleman in. You may know this gentleman from a recent clip we uh, just posted. He is the official shit starter of the left, the white instigator, like issues. Derek Varn. Hey, Derek, in the house. Hey. So, I don't know what to expect tonight because the NFL is debuting, and it was really hard for me to do this show because I'm one of those guys that actually likes the football. But when I think Pascal picked this topic, and then Gene suggests that we get Kuba and, and Derek on. And so whenever I make these videos, I have to do research. I can't just make a video. And lately, we've been doing a lot of shows where I have to watch an insane amount of postmodernist thought, post-Marxist thought, and I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. It makes me angry. I call Pascal angry, <laughs> mildly confused. So this this watching, I, 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 I'm not going to lie and say that I knew who Alexander Dugan was before I had to do this research. Thank you, Derek, gave me some things to read. <clears throat> then I also went down, of course, the rabbit hole of, of footage and interviews with the gentleman. Um, interesting character. So here is a clip for this to get you guys ready. Where we ask the question, are Nazballs real? Trying to be a white. Go ahead, Roy. Go ahead. Now, let me tell you. Sit down. Sit down. You're gonna be kidding. You're gonna be kidding. You're gonna be kidding. Hey, hold it. Hold it. Sit down. Everything is relative, and we need. We in Russia, we could use postmodernity in order to explain to the West that if any truth is re re uh, relative. So we have our special Russian truth that you need to accept as something that maybe is not your truth. Even if it's not true. But if the truth is relative, yeah. it, that doesn't mean that the truth doesn't exist. Yeah. That means that the absolute truth, one for all, uh, doesn't exist. Neoliberal capitalism is in crisis across much of the world as discontent directed towards the prevailing political and economic order grows. Mainstream political parties, both on the liberal left and conservative right, 
are facing new challenges to their political hegemony as ever-growing numbers of people are being attracted to political programs and ideologies that were once ostracized from polite society. This trend is partly manifested in the form of a resurgent left, albeit one that remains extremely weak. However, a more significant challenge of the mainstream is coming from the far right. Given this new reality, some individuals on the left are advocating a left-right alliance directed at overthrowing the establishment. Others warn about the dangers of third and fourth positionism, Strasserism, and Nazbols. In this episode, we will ask, what is the historical background behind calls for cooperation between the radical left and right? And what are the Strasserites, third positionists, and Nazbols? And what is the reality of left-right cooperation and overlap? This is Revolution. I state your name. Uh, Do you hereby solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies foreign and domestic. Against all enemies foreign and domestic. Serving with the unorganized civilian militia, which guards my homeland, my state, and the constitutions thereof. Six separate tyrannists. Six Six separate separate tyrannists. Pluck one issue out of the headlines, which uh, certainly was a big deal during the Sochi Olympics as well. Uh, Gay rights. Where's Dugan on that? Well, Dugan would say that the way it's currently used, the issue of homosexual rights, homosexual marriage, is really often part of a ideological propaganda war that the West wages on traditional societies. That's one way that Dugan would see it. So it's never just an issue by itself. It always belongs to this larger set of issues. And Dugan would say, look, if you want to order your marital relations in that way, if you want to understand sexual identity in that way, you're welcome to do so. But you shouldn't go around dictating to the rest of the world because they may think of marriage in completely different terms. They may think of sexual identity in completely different terms. And we have to respect those deep cultural differences. So Dugan, he's not for, you know, violence against gays in Russia. Not, not, no, not homophobic. Not, no, he's not homophobic. It's nothing like that. It's that Russia has its own traditions that need to be allowed to develop organically and properly without this imposition of the idea that gay marriage or homosexual relations are the, are the, are the best, they're the standard, they must be respected, they must be celebrated. If the West would like to celebrate them, let the West celebrate them, that would be Dugan's position. It's not for but Russia. If it's not for Russia, and it's, there may be other countries as well that uh, agree with him on that point. Shall we hear? Okay. What did you guys think of the video, Barn? <laughs> That's uh, the Duganist thing that you know the, the the appeal to postmodernism is a far right tactic that goes back at least to the '90s. Um, uh, the first people to really try it were were uh, the French uh, New Right, and. Um, what they did is they appealed to plural uh, pluralism, epistemic pluralism, and things like human biodiversity, um, which is was used in a double speak way. Um, the 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 biggest proponent of this is is uh, a guy called Alain de Bonis uh, de bon- Bonis. My French is shit. So I apologize to your audience for that. Y'all can say it. Yeah. Um, and um, he started pushing this around like uh, uh, in the American context um, around a book called On Being Pagan, which was an attempt to like uh, use um, a mixture of postmodernism and pagan resurgence to like develop a a kind of anti-liberal identity um now dugan doesn't come out of that but they're in dialogue with each other and dugan's an interesting figure and his i mean he is uh despite his postmodernist talk he's also known for going on places like alex jones I, I'm a little bit hesitant to ascribe to him the kind of dark majesty a lot of American liberals do, though, because they didn't notice him until Trump. And by that time, he'd actually even already lost his position um, at Moscow University for being too extreme. So um, the right. 
but mm-hmm. sorry to interrupt you, but do you think one of the reasons why he was on Alex Jones is because he kind of got pushed out and yes. that was the place that would take him at that point? I, I do. Um, like he wasn't as welcome on RT. Um, he also, however, has been very interested in a, for a long time in making inroads into anti-imperialist left media and by encouraging national Bolshevism and, um, and Red Brown alliances in Europe explicitly. Um, not so much in the United States. Uh, and the reasons for that are complicated, partly because of his specific form of, of, uh, post-fascism fourth positionism is based on Eurasianism and he sees the U S U S is geographic position as a kind of ideological competitor. That's it's automatically hostile to any form of, of like what he would say, organic nationalism. Um, but there's, there's like a long history here and it's not one that you can just like drop down into like I'm doing right now with Dugan. Um, well, so, well, we, well, why don't we start with the beginning, right? This this is a show where not everybody that's listening is an expert on Eastern European, uh, <laughs> what uh, what was it? Uh, Avant garde fascism was a quote that I I read somewhere, and I fucking had to write that down. Cuba or Pascal? Can one of you guys kind of give an introduction to the idea of what? national bolshevism is because i know a lot of people probably get a little confused when they see the hammer and the sickle on the on the red and white nazi flag i think if i could jump Mm -hmm. i'm i think i can tease out some questions that can elicit the best answers from cuba and vaughn on the subject because i think they have more expertise Cuba actually being Eastern European and Vaughn. You're going to say Cuba being a Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't say that. And, and Vaughn being a student of reactionary right. Oftentimes, one of the mechanisms that the right wing tries to do to escape its accusation of being reactionary or fascist is to say, well, the Nazis were socialists and try to ascribe that ridiculous trite appellation to the left. What often becomes an obfuscation by those who try to respond that Nazism was a right-wing ideology was the way in which there was a flank of Nazism that was left that was purged, particularly Strasserism, and there was a kind of attempt to implement a kind of state statism, a left statism into Nazism that was purged because actually Hitler appealed to the capitalists. If you Gentlemen, can can you talk about the early stages of that left flank of Nazism that was killed and how it constantly became a ploy of reactionaries and nationalists to appeal to disaffected, particularly disaffected men, to appeal for their need of a nation state to to kind of uh, support them in the age of neoliberal capitalism? So can we go from there and kind of move on to how those themes are con- consistently recurring. Is that something that you guys could do for us, our audience? Sure. I'm, I'm happy to. Um, I'm happy to try that out. But I would actually go even further back um, because I think that a lot of the heart of this kind of third positionism, whether it's national Bolshevism or, or other, um, you know, incipient far-right movements come is something that Americans especially have a great deal of difficulty contextualizing because in the United States, conservatism is associated with the uh, right flank of this kind of liberal constitutional um, order, which, you know, has the some very reactionary, very, um, fundamentally racist, white supremacist um, elements to it, but has this patina of enlightenment constitutionalism, enlightenment liberalism, the constitution having all of these individual rights. It's a right rights-based document. It's supposed to be a rational system. So conservatism is conflated with this 
old fashioned liberalism coming from the Enlightenment, while European conservatism, especially continental um, European uh, conservatism, is an ideology that is predates the Enlightenment and is fundamentally ambivalent to those liberal individual rights, um, Enlightenment uh, accretions that it picks up in the United States. And instead it goes, it looks all the way back to European tradition. And depending on which conservative you ask, that may mean uh, Christianity in a kind of integralist Pope and emperor way, or it might mean a tribalism, some type of European paganism, Germanic, Slavic, uh, Celtic, you name it. Um, some, it often includes elements of uh, like deep racist um, blood tradition that uh, there is a genealogy that links people uh, together into these primordial communities that really represent the ultimate identity of the people that belong to them. And attempting to individualize people is actually a tremendous violence against tradition, against community. Um, so that type of conservatism is um, where these third and fourth position, these including like national socialism itself, uh, come out of. And can I complicate that a bit though? Please. Um, in the case of France and Italy, in specific, um, uh, the the founders of the of the national syndicalist and the and the and the early fascist movement were almost to a person former Marxist or former anarchist. Um, that's true for Robert Michel. That's true for Mussolini, actually. And what what is interesting about them, and I think what makes their positionism different than just blood and soil nationalism, is that they thought that the romantic nationalism of the prior period was not sufficient enough. Um, that and that they didn't really believe it in the same way. Like uh, Sorel thought all this was a myth to automate people, not that it was there was anything true about it. And he was in, he did not. Sorel himself never abandoned the left, even though he was totally willing to perpetrate anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. He didn't even really believe um, to try to animate people against banking into socialist positions, and he was willing to do that you know, well into the 20th century. Um, so I think you're completely right. There's this organic conservatism, um, but there is a, there is a shift with their positionism because what, what they call the organic conservatism is the baseline. Then there is the first ideology, the first position, which is liberalism. And then there is the second ideology which is socialism, communism, etc. And then the third position is a synthesis of the baseline with the second ideology creating a new thing. Um, and this is explicit in um, in in Mussolini, and it leads to a lot of confusion, I think, even in the, the European context, because a lot of the founders of these movements were not we're not just coming out of the left tradition. They were coming out of the left of the left tradition. Mussolini was associated with the, with the left, you know, the proto left communist adjacent flank of the, of the socialist movement in, in Italy. And he embraces this organic conservatism somewhat cynically. Um, but I think what is interesting about this, this organicism is it gives, there's more ground for them to play with in the U S the only equivalent to that is basically neo-confederacism and like, like Southern aristocracy stuff. That's it. Like there's not, there's nothing else. There's no blood and soil sentiment to cynically use in the same way. 
Um, I mean, groups tried. The Silver Shirts tried. I mean, ironically, like, um, the second great instantiation of national Bolshevism is from a guy called uh, Francis Pottsworth Yaki, Yaki, who was an American, who Imperial. was a fascist, yeah, who was a fascist who got obsessed with Stalin. Um, and, you know, but it's... A lot of it is like Stalin. Yeah, oh yeah, a, a bunch. Um, um, but it's... Uh, I, I think the reason why it has been so much more powerful historically in Europe is also like for a lot of these people, I mean, particularly these organic, you know, uh, um, conservatives, like revolutionary conservatives, they would have called themselves, which despite the fact it's kind of a contradiction in terms. Um, I'm from Demestra Ford, you know, right after the French revolution. Um, the, the, the third positionists really were interested in trying to take elements of this organicism that was already on the right and combine it with um, economic policies they saw from the left because they realized that they could not go back to a medieval economic structure, that it was just not viable. Um, so that was the, the, but that's the right end. That's the kind of what the Hitlerist thought. When you look at the Strasserist, um, they seem to come at it. A lot of them really are sincere nationalists, sincere national chauvinists. They really do believe that their race and their, and specifically by their race, they mean their ethnicity. Like they, they don't mean white people in general. They mean Germans. Um, and maybe Aryans as a broader coalition. And that's, and that gets defined weirdly politically. Um, they thought that you could cynically use this organic conservatism that was more based in Europe, more based in this pre-modern conception that's still around there in a way that's kind of not in the subtle colonial states. Um, and, and glom on to a, a national social, po social policy with it. What they really did sincerely side with a national chauvinist on was a, an absolute rejection of internationalism, at least in, in, in the fascist and Nazi context, that actually gets weirder when it gets to, na to national Bolshevism and it, it's that you get into a, a crazy fever dream in the fifties. But, but yeah, I mean, it, that, this is still not only a thing, it's, it is a real threat in Europe. I mean, I think in a way that people, I think well, in a way that people, the, in the, mm -hmm. I, I think that one, important element is the linguistic difference between European nations. When you have a Hungarian language, a Russian language, um, those linguistic uh, divisions, then ethnicity and the particular tradition of um, the Russophone or, um, you know, you name it, uh, Slavic, Germanic uh, peoples, that identity has a lot more salience than simple race. Uh, it also, there's a long history, you know, European history is nothing but one giant um, melee of white on white violence. So yeah. the racial categories that are used in colonial settings um, to delineate um, kind of uh, essentialized status categories make no sense in a uh, European continent, which is wall to wall Caucasian, but has all of these long standing um, practical and identitarian um, ethnic distinctions. And I think that the um, that one of the great aspirations of people like Dugan and the, the whole fourth position fourth position as concept is to create essentially a fascist international yeah. that um, it doesn't matter that we all have different um, romanticized, mythologized national chauvinisms. The fact that we're all national chauvinists, to use a word, uh, to use a term that um, has popped up in the, in the chat quite correctly, um, unifies us in opposition to the globalists, the cosmopolitans, the liberals, you know, those cucks. And right. um, that, and the, 
failure, the visible um, failure of global neoliberalism to live up to its promises. Um, and that sense of global crisis and social crisis within individual countries that has come from that makes people open to extreme uh, counter systemic um, solutions. And the advantage that these kind of far right ideologies have is that they combine some of the rational program of the left with a mystical appeal to greater powers and a kind of call to adventure that a rational enlightenment ideology like Marxism doesn't are you, have. Are you talking about this traditionalism? Yeah, radical traditionalism. Uh, Religion-ish, cultish thing that a lot of these guys are into. Yeah. Like Dugan and Bannon and what's the cat in Brazil? Um, Bolsonaro. But his guru, spiritual guru. Oh, um... I'm not sure who the Brazilian is, but the um, it often these types aren't real believers, but they like having a uh, a mission or uh, something to stand for, in in the same way that you know, like Fast and the Furious is just a car movie, except you know when the concept of family gets introduced, mm. because that mm. that is the bigger thing that can justify whatever you need to justify i think the, the the brazilian's name is olavo yes think. yes that's the guy and um when i talk about the call to adventure i also mean their love of violence so the um that like isis and isis has a lot in common with these fourth positional movements um there's a rather than promising a better future um the fascists promise you a glorious struggle which um might in fact probably will kill you but that's okay because it's more important than you are i'd like to interject here because this is a theme that we've tried to talk about in the past but um i really like to really plug into this how much of this discourse this kind of traditionalist fascism if you will is rooted in masculinist insecurity or the need to to uh, masculine reformation or the or, or how much of it is really about or cover for the desire to rehabilitate masculinity i see that kind of discourse is very prevalent in the american reactionary right and i'm finding out that it's also somewhat prevalent prevalent in the european manifestations of the reactionary right as well. Is this really an attempt to supplant the phase of American capitalism to provide stable living conditions and economic paradigms for large segments of working class men, white, black, or otherwise, and that inability being filled with the vacuum of you know a crypto fascism? I think it was Lenin who says that Fascism is simply capitalism in decay. That's not your, oh. that's a false quote. Not, okay, well, not to be not to be before. rude, but it's a false quote. Um, I, I think that um, I think that you're absolutely correct. The there's a um, quality to liberalism that, um, and this is the place where a lot of um, the far right movements get their juice. Liberalism in this global capitalist variant is very comfortable being woke and standing up for feminism, standing up for women, standing up for LGBT rights, standing up for racial minorities. So, um, and it doesn't have any sympathy for losers in the marketplace. If you're a male that belongs to the majority group and you, you're entirely conventional in your outlook uh, and you just want to have a family like, you know, you imagine your parents had, then if you can't earn in the market, if you don't have that value to your neoliberal masters, well, there's nothing for you, you know, just go, go and die. Um, while the uh, people who triumph in the marketplace 
that belong to um, formerly marginalized groups are held up and celebrated. And the LGBT um, sort of gay rights um, package of you know gay marriage, pride celebrations, um, uh, trans rights is where a great deal of rightist energy comes from, opposition to that. And I think that's because it's a place where the left and liberals can agree that there's a um, kind of a room for progress. And um, it's highly threatening to traditionalist males um, while the far right movements are very comfortable making opposition to those rights, opposition to that package of um, policies, a centerpiece of their appeal. So, so what's interesting about the modern third and fourth position, and specifically the modern ones, and we can go back and talk about um, Strasserism and all that and why it gets abused on the left. This has become a very easy target to throw at people, by the way, because just by talking to me, but you are now two steps removed from somebody in one of these movements, just so you know. So now Alex Reed Ross can write an article about you. But... Um, I mean, it's, I was one step before I started talking to you. So, so okay, so maybe down. you're now double to one step. But the, the the issue here is there is both an appeal to a masculinist ideology and to like national revitification, and you see this over and over again in in these movements. Both the conservative what the conservative reactionary movements prior to third positionism do this too. Like the the German nationalist movement was was really big on pushing. Um, ideas of national agreement. The Italian um, fascist movement talked all the time about how Italy was the proletarian nation of Europe um, and was cut out. So national agreement is put, put into, masculinist ideology is put into. However, it's also important to remember that historically the third positionist were more willing to grant suffrage to women sometimes even over socialist, which is a complicated subject that we'd have to get into. They, they rarely ever did it, but they would promise it because they also wanted to include women in this sphere of national revitalization, which is a little bit different from what you see amongst the kind of people who are attracted to this now. Um, the, the idea that most of these people are, were, were or all are poor, either in the United States or in Europe, is kind of a historical liberal myth. Um, they didn't. They tended to be downwardly mobile, um, but in the case of both the fascist and um, the Nazis, and if you do demographic studies on a lot of the th these far right movements in Europe now, they tend to be um, what we would call petty bourgeois explicitly, um, and a petty bourgeois that's uneducated. So there is a correlation between uneducatedness, but not. Um, but I think also a lot of the energy and a lot of the leadership comes from um, the reactionary elements of the intelligentsia that have nowhere to go. You can't be, mm -hmm. a, it's hard to be a conservative professor nowadays, try being a, you know, a white nationalist professor at most universities. <laughs> right. And I mean, the, yes. Um, well, in Canada, it works real well, apparently. The, uh, I mean, it does until you get purged, right? Like there's a reason that, Jordan Peterson is on Patreon and not at the University of Toronto teaching. Um, the the gentleman that had the clip at the end of the clip, Michael Millerman. Uh, they gave him a PhD and sent him on his way. The um, and Greg Johnson, the head of the of uh, of um, what is it called? Counter. It's not Counterpunch. That's a leftish magazine. Um, but Counter Reaction or something like that. He he one of the one of the actual older alt-right organizations or we call them alt right now just we could call them what they are they're uh, a nazi organization was a literature professor who got purged and became reactionary after he was purged um yeah. and it, the, yeah you've got um you've got that group together with um the most intense of the old guard country club racists that provide the intellectual direction and the capital for these kinds of movements because for those particular individuals the anti-egalitarianism of third positionism fascism 
allows them to reconstitute their identity as a kind of uh, aristocracy in waiting. That uh, and that aristocratic impulse that we are better either because of genetically or because of some characteristic of, of will um, that we're going to take what's ours because we're better is a important part of the appeal as well. The rejection of equality, which is a hallmark of socialism. I would oh, go ahead. Derek. Yeah. Well, we're getting into the equality thing, which we could fight over for days, but um, uh, the, the interesting thing about a lot of these people historically, and you and this is you go to uh, Otto Strasser, the more left wing of the two Strasser brothers, um, to Edward Limonoff. Um, and, and I wanted to read a quote from Limonoff that said, uh, "Lenin lacked the insolence and honesty to declare that only a party of talented misfits is capable of carrying out a revolution." Yeah. So. So Edward Limonoff, which you see a lot of a lot of out of a lot of these people, is they actually do start off not just as leftists. They start off as part of like the standard leftist organization, even like um, Otto Strasser um, joined the SP Day and also joined the Freikorps almost immediately, uh, as as the right wing of the SP Day was kind of you know crypto encouraging the Freikorps to go and purge its 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 enemies to the left. It's one of the great sins of the 20th century in the Bavar you know. And the Bavarian so, uh, Soviet, which ended ended the German Revolution, probably destroyed the the. It's you know, if you want to trace it back far enough, it's probably the the beginnings of of the end of of the USSR at the beginning. Um, so, you know, you have this you have this history there, but there is this irony in all these people where you have an appeal to elitism and an appeal to an egalitarian national subject. So it's class collaborationist explicitly um, so that you can have both this aristocratic element, but not an as aristocratic element that is in competition with its own, in quotation marks, proletariat, that they have a role and they are also better than, um, you know, whatever national group you, you want to suppress. And, and when the Nazis, it's not just Jews, it's also Slavs, it's also... Uh, gypsies. It's also like it's everybody. Most it's everybody. You know, uh, because even that, the other Aryans are like degenerate Aryans. So well, um, if even and and also that sub all of those inferior peoples, right? All of the Unta mentioned the nationalistly the nationalist defined um, lesser groups are what will allow your proletariat to become aristocrat. Um, because once you have your um, plantations, be they in Pretoria, be they in um, Polonia, be they in um, Texas, you you know every white man, every Aryan can be a master, regardless of how humble their particular origins may be. Well, the question I want to ask, really, in terms of the practicality of all this coming down to today's times, is that, number one, for figures like Steve Bannon, does he actually believe in this rhetoric or discourse, or is this a means to an end of a different variation for him? Is he actually trying to mobilize some type of broad kind of uh, white identitarian masculinist movement around this type of traditionalist discourse is he just throwing up trial balloons second of all do we actually have a faction of the left or leftists because i don't believe we have a left of leftists that are trying to reach out to these reactionaries out of some kind of ridiculous notions of a red brown alliance and is the even idea of having right-wing populists ridiculous off the bat if you guys want to tackle all three, <laughs> yeah, uh, I would say um, it's hard to know what Bannon actually believes. But what I would say is, if he believes in a a kind of third, fourth positionism, it's actually the Catholic one, which is a which is a, a corporatist, integralist positionism, and more more related to this older form of reactionary. Um, 
conservatism that will use race actually as a proxy for religion. Um, and which, but this gets complicated in the case of Catholics because you have this whole, this whole thing with, with anti-Latino sentiment. Um, in the case of, of the, of the populist right in America, what I would say is that with Trump, we saw, we saw American right wing thought become more European, ironically that it resembles a lot more of what you would see in a Berlusconi, in a, um, uh, I, I think Berlusconi probably is Norm the analogous Pider. figure. Yeah. Maybe a Boris Johnson. I mean, Trump, wait, wait, Mark, you said it again, that's a very interesting formulation. I liked it. Say it again for the people in the back that with the rise of Trump, we saw American conservatives, conservatism become more European. Yeah, they become American become, conservatism became more European in its appeal. It lost interest, probably because of the contradictions that occurred under under the Bush administration and neoconservatism in the fig leaf of liberalism. Partially also because, and I think Pascal, you actually pointed this out to someone else on a different show on this channel that this group of conservatives no longer have any familial thread to like the old aristocratic New England, um, you know, aris, you know, proto bourgeois and bourgeois that has made up the leadership of the country until basically Barack Obama and even Barack Obama had a little bit of a tie to it. So, I mean, through his, uh, through his mother's family, but that that's kind of over now. And so what you see is an appeal to um, populism, an appeal to more explicit blood and soil, ideologies the the thing about like the u.s u.s liberalism and you you know you it was a set of ideology it was rooted in blood um and in fact whiteness as a concept actually has more to do with this than any of the stuff that we're talking about but it was an inclusive whiteness whiteness was deliberately always expanding um this is not an inclusive ethno category it's 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 deliberately actually retractions of like who counts as what like mm -hmm. by a lot of these people i would not count as part of this you know ultimate you know, group of of whitey Is for it example you like sean king sure um um <laughs> but to, to exploit varn's momentary stumble um the i think that one of the important differences one of uh, between third positionism and, and socialism and liberalism is liberals believe that everybody can get along in a market mm. as long as um you know we play by the rules and that maybe some technocratic tweaks will will handle any problems that arise and um socialists see a class struggle a universal class struggle is taking place within societies the real conflict is between um the owners of everything and everyone else the third position takes the idea of international you know conflict between peoples as the driving force of history they and they mean it they a lot of um what i think bannon is uh, preoccupied with and people like bannon even if they don't go in for all of the trappings of, you know, like Bubba racism, it's going to be, how do we make our nation great and strong so that we can fight the other great and strong nations like China? And mm -hmm. because China has a greatness and a strength that the fascists respect, even if they hate it for racial reasons or, or they take its, um, communism seriously as a as a ideological um, club, and that leads to a hostility towards a liberalism that erodes solidarity within the nation. And uh, we can't have a capitalism that corrode, you know, that separates the um, worker from, the, you know, the the American or the ethnically correct worker from the ethnically correct owner, manager, landlord, you name it. Um, but because we need to concentrate on the fact that we're going to be fighting these other nations. And if we don't, 
then either through um, war, overt conflict, or through immigration, or through um, what they would call cultural degeneracy and what everybody else might call multiculturalism and not being a dick, um, those outside alien forces are going to dissolve our, um, our people. You know, Jews will not replace us, that kind of thing. And white genocide. And these are, these are real preoccupations. They're not faking it. That's what they're worried about. Um, and if you belong to a small European nation like that, yeah, as a Polish person, um, I speak Polish. Having settled in Canada, I don't, I don't know if um, any children I have will speak Polish. Um, it's a country of 40 million people that's aging. A lot of people move out. Um, this, you know, it's it's possible that in a hundred years, no one will speak Polish because why would you? Um, if you're Estonian or Hungarian, the prospect of your cultural distinctiveness through no necessary hostility or great calamity, but just through the regular workings of social and economic forces, um, that cultural tradition is going to go extinct. And some people find that extraordinarily alarming and worth a fascist style mobilization to, um, to reassure themselves that it won't happen. Well, regardless of whether or not we want to uh, adhere to the veracity on that quote on Lenin, it's sure it might be a fake quote, but it actually has truth mm -hmm. in terms of praxis regarding what's actually happening, in that capitalism is, is basically in crisis and fascism is developing in its in its collapse, or its crisis, I should say. Right, we, don't yeah. wanna, we don't want to be predeterminative in saying capitalism is collapsing. But that being said, you know, what exactly does that mean in terms of the capacity for these, these reactionaries to uh, formulate a kind of a international movement? I mean, I, 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 I think that C. Derek Vaughan said one of the most fascinating things I've heard in a while, it's an analysis that I actually have not heard, and then Vaughan, if you got it from somebody else, you better cough it up because I'm not trying to give you this much credit for something <laughs> that you didn't make up your own. That the the kind of conservatism that Trump was offering was more European in nature than many of the contemporary variations that we've seen. I I can see why that happens because, you know, unlike a lot of people in America, I was watching the rise of these reactionary conservative movements in Europe in the early aughts, even before Obama. Only because, you know, coming from, you know, a former, you know, French, French, French colony, I watched Marine Le Pen in France. I watched the whole, you know, Front National. I, I watched the, you know, the UKIP, and you know what's going on, and and seeing how nativism, anti-immigration, were all being used as proxies to blame what was clearly a consequence of the economic turn to austerity in in uh, in the these European countries, it did not surprise me that America developed its own manifestation in the likes of Trump. And sadly for most Americans who are not students of what's going on in Europe and other countries, they don't realize that Trump was actually a later iteration of a phenomenon that had been happening in Europe for almost half, over half a decade before. So what is the consequence of this uh, crystallization, if you will, of this upswing in global reactionary nationalism if we do acknowledge that we have no real left in the world and the neoliberals seem to be stepping all over themselves? I think that the the big biggest mobilization issue for the far right and what may determine its prospects for success is immigration, particularly 
immigration on a large scale of asylum seekers rather than um, you know high skills economic migrants. Um, if it's and that's going to be exacerbated by climate change, right? Yeah. The movement of Syrian and Afghan, Middle Eastern and African uh, migrants after um, in 2015 gave the European far right a huge boost. And the, um, the American far right, this Europeanized version of uh, American conservatism, they gain every time there's a quote unquote car caravan coming up from right. Central America. The and liberals have a great deal of trouble regulating immigration because on the one hand, there's a concept of cosmopolitanism where you shouldn't get into people's way if they want to make a better life for themselves. And on the other hand, it's uh, undocumented laborers are uh, undocumented migrants are the most exploitable working class you can have. So it's beneficial for them as economic actors, um, as well as being something that they can I, kind of ideologically uh, re make themselves comfortable with. Uh, conservatives and uh, a lot of people who are downwardly mobile, a lot of people who are in competition with, the, with migrant uh, labor, they react viscerally to um, immigration as an electoral issue. And it's not even um, necessarily in the American context or in the Canadian context limited to white people. You'll yeah. have people from established minority groups who hate the idea of newcomers upending what precarious economic circumstances they've managed to make for themselves. So and... there's several Pew studies that back this up, actually, that that whatever group thinks they're economically threatened by an outside group, you'll see you'll see um, latent racialized tendencies emerge. And it is not just among white people and study after study. It's among every single group in the country. And you also see, quote, interminority, unquote, tension increase. During well, isn't that part well. of the, the, the ADOS, uh, the Africans will not replace us? We see that um, in all places. I mean, so I, I would also add to Pascal and, and Cuba's uh, analysis that when I, I was in Asia during this, you know, turn um, and I saw it there, too. We started now in, in Asia, in most Asian countries, except for Japan, it's actually largely been pushed back. Um, Japan is the outlier case. Um, but. You saw the the and and in India, I guess India is a pretty big outlier case. Actually, now that I think about it, what but, about the um, Philippines and Duterte? Okay, so there's a bunch. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't. Sure. Um, yeah, <laughs> but I was, I was I was thinking about actually how it, like you've seen you've seen victories in South Korea amongst the liberal set, not amongst the left. In fact, they're cracking down on the left now in South Korea. But um, um, and in um. Uh, it's somewhat in Taiwan, um, the KMT plays a, we a weird role that is very similar to this. Uh, uh, th there's a additional complications in Taiwan because of the historical relationship to um, China, um, to put it mildly. But the the, um, the you saw this there too, and you've seen it. You, you saw it, you also saw it kind of start in Latin America, not just with Bolsonaro um, in Brazil, which is the most obvious. That also has a long tradition of this, um, but it looked like um, the kind of the, the right liberal governments of Colombia started sounding a lot more like Euro European right governments. Um, and it's, it's been interesting where it succeeds and not. I, I will say that very poor countries, this doesn't seem to to really have a lot of sticking power, whereas in like middle income countries or downwardly mobile rich countries, it seems to have a lot of sticking power. Um, uh, it's mm -hmm. left response to the incipient far right. 
there needs to be a position that on on immigration that's articulated clearly that isn't open borders um and short of that there's going to be a very substantial portion of the downwardly mobile middle class and um anxious uh, you know american-born working class that will not take a left program seriously well they will not take it seriously because why uh, because unless you can answer them like what are we going to do about immigration um how is immigration not a threat to me how um are you just going to let everybody in um if there isn't a reassuring response there then the feeling will be that socialism is for the global huddling masses yearning to be free and not for people who are struggling domestically well then you're basically damning americans are being innately reactionary and assuming that the oh. nation state I'm, you don't? I don't think this is just the United States. I think this applies. This is the you ever been in the UK? Course. You ever seen oh, no. so you, what you're saying is that people? this is the case in Europe primarily, but not only not particularly just the United States. I'm, as well. No, I'm saying this is the case everywhere. Anywhere. Yeah. Anywhere. Anywhere. You ever to France? Been, yeah. Japan, Japan, Germany? Korea, I I I I think China. I wanna Italy? I wanna Greece. Okay, I want to push back on some of this framework because the social democratic nonsense is getting on my nerves. Um, but um, you yelling you cannot... at me on my show? <laughs> no, I actually completely agree. You have to address what what people what people say about immigration and how it's going to respond to them. Um, I totally agree with that point. What I what I disagree with is the idea that we're going to have to placate in doing this uh na nation states because frankly that's a failing proposition right now like it won't work these nation states aren't viable enough given particularly given what they've been based off of in the past to continue at their at their current state of prosperity forever pre without a whole lot of other stuff that's going to exacerbate the want you know the the need for refugees to move so you can't you can't like say oh we need to have this thing other than open borders okay fine but what because because the 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 option is we can just keep our nation states the way they are that's not that's just that's not viable yeah, it I mean, really is not long term viable. I mean, like, no, like Canada is a sitting duck eventually for the United States just to roll over the border and take it. You're uh, um, <laughs> fair enough. However, there's um, there's a very deep pool of people who um, will hear, let's reimagine nation states, let's abolish nation states, and they'll reach for their AR 15. Um, the I, I haven't seen a persuasive response to the problem of immigration, uh, to the question of immigration, especially, and I'm expecting there to be a tremendous amount of um, refugee flows caused by climate change. And I don't think that we have a framework for accommodating that reality. And there's going to be a default of liberals hand waving and ultimately the far right is going to just start killing people and that'll be the the start of act five well on that note we are at an hour so before derek yells at kuba <laughs> and before pascal yells at everybody for yelling in general if you haven't done it become a patron you can see the next half of this, which is going to be very much no holes barred. Because <laughs> right now, these guys are trying to tone it down. I don't know why. It's like we all do this. So everyone's like, okay, we got to be professional for the first hour. 
That's why Pascal's been so quiet. <laughs> trying to be professional. The second hour. If you want to see that second hour, there's only one way. Become a patron or know me personally. One of the two. Derek, Kuba, are you guys ready? Yeah. Just try to stop me. He's literally got a pin in the point he wants to make. That's why he doesn't want to talk. Derek doesn't want to say goodbye right now because he's like, <laughs> I got to keep this thought in my head because I got some fire for Kuba's ass. That's fucked up, Derek. I just want you to know that. <laughs> no, I'm actually. You call I'm a comrade. <laughs> <laughs> We're both uh, we're both hyper pessimistic on some of the things we're about to mention. So I'm with three of the most pessimistic motherfuckers in the world. I'm not pessimistic. I'm just even keel. Negro, please. You're the most pessimistic motherfucker out of everybody on the screen right now. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys very much for enjoying this. For those of you that are patrons, we will see you in about probably five minutes. Cause this I got we gotta hurry up and get Derek's point because this motherfucker can't even laugh all the way. He's like, <laughs> yeah, look at that uh, jaw, right? <laughs> building up. <laughs> all right, guys, and we are out.